Thanks so much. Could I just say this, that this morning when Matt interviewed me, he introduced me as the person who has the privilege of leading you. And I just want to say, it's just been impressed on me so powerfully today. What a wonderful people to have the privilege of leading. I really feel that. You know, all, the, all that happens in this festival, this team's around serving all the time, serving behind the scenes, those who have been leading you in these meetings, in worship, in hosting the meetings, in speaking, all over the place, people are taking responsibility as I walk around the, the site, as I've been doing, just seeing the willing people of God ready for the day of God's power. That's what I see, and thank you so much. It's a privilege to have the opportunity to serve and lead you. I wanna speak now on men and women who accomplish the purposes of God. And the Bible is the story of the mission of God to put everything right in this world and the whole universe through Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. That's what the Bible is. And all the way through, God has graciously used various individuals and his people corporately to play their unique role in that great plan. Now, Martin exhorted us to go last night. I'm not going to do that again. Rather, I'm going to talk about being the men and women of God that he can use. And I'm going to do that by telling the story of Esther from the book of Esther in the Old Testament. As many of you know, who've heard me preach recently, I like to now preach through stories. And so that's what I'm gonna do, just to tell that story. And it's a book, the book of Esther, doesn't even mention God at all, but talks about two people, Esther and Mordecai, who are, who are uniquely and miraculously fulfilled God's purposes. Now, it happened at a time of great importance in world history. At the same time as these events, Confucius was teaching in China and seeing Chinese civilization rise. Greece was experiencing a flowering of culture, development of democracy, and great literature plays still perform today. In between Greece and China was the mighty uh, Persian Empire, which covered from today's Pakistan to Sudan, two countries that have been mentioned already tonight. But God's purposes at that time, even though all that was happening, God's plan was being fulfilled through two ordinary, obedient individuals. And this brilliant story gives the reasons for the Jewish feast of Purim, still celebrated by the Jewish people all over the world today. And it's strange, really, the book, until I really got into it, I hadn't realized how full of fun the book of Esther is. Even though it's recording serious and dangerous events, it's full of surprises and even jokes. It's a moment in history of the great Persian Empire, and yet it's full of humorous exaggeration. You might say, sorry, you can't say that. Yes, I can. It's a type of literature that makes the point by, 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 by her hyperbole, by exaggeration. It's a feast that lasts six months, gallows as high as a six-story building. Even the names of the, court, court, the people of the, of the court, the courtiers, every so often the writer gives a whole list of these names. And all those names would have sounded absolutely ridiculous and great fun when read, read to a Hebrew uh, audience. It's 
demonstrating the achieving of God's purposes, the rescue of the Jews, but also pokes fun at the foolishness of proud rulers and their stupidity in making decisions. Perhaps today I'm trying to think of an equivalent. Maybe it's sort of the, the black adder view of history. <laughs> okay, how foolish it all was, and yet also terrible. Or more recently, the horrible histories books that our children learn from. It's theology told with satire, irony, and humor. And one commentator said this, Humour takes the edge off horror and makes it possible to read a story we would not otherwise be able to read. Because it's a terrible, terrible story. It's a story of near genocide. It's a story of what happens when people have absolute power. It's a story of terrible abuse of young women, of a of a sort that we can hardly imagine today. And so the humour takes the edge off the horror. Well, what's the story then? Let me tell the story of Esther. King Xerxes was ruler over the Persian Empire. A great figure in world history, I remember you learning about him at school. The Hebrew Bible calls him Ahasuerus. That doesn't mean much to us, does it? Does Ahasuerus help you any more than Xerxes? But actually, Ahasuerus, the nearest equivalent would be King Headache. <laughs> it's a joke, it's a pun. King Headache. And they're poking fun at him all the time, even though he was an absolute ruler. He throws a great banquet for six months for his nobles and then a seven-day feast for all the inhabitants of Susa, the capital city. And his only rule was, there are no restrictions on how much you can drink. Men only together, as was the culture, and Queen Vashti was having a separate party for the women. And then, just imagine, just imagine this. Seven days of drunkenness amongst the men, and then Ahasuerus, Xerxes, headache, orders his wife to come and parade her beauty in front of all these drunk guys. It's horrible. Vashti refused. She dishonoured and shamed King Headache. And in honour-based societies, shaming constitutes a grave offence which regularly produces the most extreme response. And you can imagine what's going on. One of the nobles said, this is awful. And again, it's exaggerated. It says, if we allow this, every woman every wife in the whole of the empire from Pakistan to Sudan will stop respecting their husbands. Nonsense. <laughs> but, so they said, we must make a new law that can never be altered. Vashti won't be queen. Women should obey their husbands. And let's translate that into every language in the empire. Then, they search for a new queen. Again, awful what they did. Collect together all the beautiful virgins you can find for the king's harem. One of these may please the king and so become queen. Now, pleasing the king was not by the power of their intellect and the brilliance of their conversation, but by spending one night with him. The only qualifications to be queen in this absurd uh, happening were beauty and sexual performance. And one of these beautiful young girls was a Jewish orphan girl called Esther. 
who lived under the care of her elder cousin, Mordecai. She is taken into the harem and prepared for a year to go to the king for one night. Morally dubious, lots of questions. Many people said, why didn't Mordecai hide her? For centuries ago, some Jewish and even Christian commentators looked at that and said, not even sure this should be in the Bible. In a totalitarian government, people had to submit to awful things. It was terrible abuse for these young women. After a night with the king, most of, the, most of them would just stay in another harem, never to be called for the rest of their lives, never to meet a husband, never to get married. Disgusting. Esther was given favour by the eunuch in charge of the harem and then so pleased the king in one night that she was given favour by him and made queen. Nobody knew she was Jewish. She had kept that a secret. Then her cousin Mordecai was one of the close advisers in the court and he heard of a plot to kill King Xerxes and told Esther who told the king so the coup was foiled. Normally, someone who did that would have been honoured immediately, but everyone forgot about it as far as Mordecai was concerned. Five years later, after Esther was made queen, another character, Haman, who was an Agagite, which means a traditional enemy of the people of Israel, was honoured by the king, so everyone had to bow to him. By the way, if you were Jewish people celebrating the Feast of Purim, which the book of Esther originated, every time the name Haman was mentioned, they would all hiss and boo. Now, if I was doing a kid's talk, I'd get them all to hiss and boo every time I said the word Haman, but I wouldn't dream of insulting your intelligence <laughs> by doing that here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're entering into it. I wasn't expecting that at all. <laughs> well, <laughs> Haman influenced the king. <laughs> uh, again, the king is seen as simply manipulated by everyone around him. He didn't think for himself at all. And he was influenced to pass a law, which cannot be changed again, on a date chosen by poor, that means lot, they threw a dice as to which day every Jew in the empire, which included the land of Israel, would be destroyed. Horrified, Mordecai put on sackcloth and sent word to Esther to ask the king to rescind the law. Esther said, he seems to have forgotten about me. He hasn't called me into his presence for a month. And nobody can go into the presence of the king uninvited. Then Mordecai made the key statement of the book. If you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. This is Esther 4 verse 14. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Who knows? We don't know what might happen, but it may be that you have come to your royal position. Who's in a royal position today? Who is? Are you? You got that much from the worship? <laughs> Sons and daughters, princes and princesses of the living God, a royal position. Who knows? You may have come to a royal position for such a day as this. Esther said, get everyone to fast. If I perish, I perish. Wow. She's 
been passive under this horrible system all this time, but now she rises up. Doesn't matter what happens to me. If I perish, I perish, but I'm going to do it. So, Esther stood at the entrance to the king's hall. The king was there on his throne. And she had the boldness, even though not called, to stand there. Stand there. What would happen? And she knew if the king put his scepter towards her, she could go in. If not, she would die. And then the king put his scepter out to her and in she went. What do you want, Queen Esther? I'll give you anything. Full of rash promises was King Headache. (laughs) Esther was very wise. She mingled faith with wisdom and didn't speak directly. After all, the king had signed this decree. So, in the words of the famous Black Adders, Black Adder stories, she devised a cunning plan. (laughs) (laughs) Please, she said, what do I want? Please just let me cook a banquet for you, king and (laughs) Haman. So they held this great banquet. And of course, wisely again, Esther said, let's leave the business to the end. I remember I was in the Middle East once and uh, it was a conference. And for me, conferences are wonderful, but I have to meet lots and lots of people. It's a great privilege to meet them, but I have to move from one to another. So I arranged to meet this guy for lunch. He was uh, very much a man of the Middle East. And we were eating together, and I thought, it's about time I got around, you know, I've got to go somewhere else after this. So I, I started asking him questions. He looked at me full of scorn and shame. And he said, you can't ask me that. I've not finished eating yet. So I got the point. And Esther certainly understood that. So right at the end, what do you want, Esther? Cunning plan not not fulfilled yet. Keeps him dangling on a string. Please, will you and Haman come to another banquet tomorrow? Oh, Haman went out. Boasted to his wife. I'm not only the favorite of the king, I'm the favorite of the queen as well. But then he saw Mordecai who wouldn't bow down to him because he was an enemy of the people of God. And he got so angry, he couldn't even enjoy the idea of being in the celebration because he was so stirred up with anger because Mordecai was still alive. He said to his wife, what shall I do? She said, build some gallows six stories high and hang him on it tomorrow. Great, that's what I'll do. That night... King Headache couldn't sleep. And what do you do when you can't sleep? Well, what you did if you were a Persian king, you got your court, some of your courtiers to sit and read to you all the great stories of your rule. And so they were reading it, and they read what was recorded that Mordecai had saved the king. The king suddenly, once in his life, showed conscience and said, I never honoured him. So next morning, he called Haman. (laughs) What what should I do for the man I want to honour? Haman, thinking it was for him, put a royal, said this, put a royal robe on him and let him ride on a royal horse. Bit like in England saying, let him ride in the coronation coach. Or in the US, let him have Air Force One. (laughs) Okay, said the king. Go and do that. Haman was thinking, wow, here it comes. Go and do that for Mordecai. (laughs) 
with dread then Haman went to the second banquet. Again, once they'd finished eating, king said, Esther, what's your request? Esther said, please spare our people that one man manipulated you into condemning to death. Who did that, said the king? Haman, said Esther. <laughs> Full of anger at being so manipulated, the king rushed from the room. Haman knew that only Esther could save him. And he went and knelt at her couch. Not wise. A man was not allowed to be within seven steps of one of the ladies in the harem, let alone the queen. The king came back and saw it and thought, hey man, was now about to sexually molest the queen. Get him out of here. And Haman was hung on his own six-story high gallows. <laughs> You're having, this is having the same effect on you as it would on the original Jewish hearers, which means that's what the job a preacher's supposed to do. Okay? <laughs> I'll just tell stories now. <laughs> the people of God were rescued and were told to celebrate this rescue each year at the Feast of Purim. And they always had one solemn day because it was a solemn occasion and then one day of great fun when they sent presents to each other and had a feast, rejoiced and celebrated. The people of God were saved. And therefore, the Messiah who came from this people would come. God's purposes fulfilled. God's purposes fulfilled by the brave actions of two people, Mordecai and Esther. So what does this teach us? Now, for many of you who just like stories, like most of the world, you've already understood everything it's taught. It's, but there's a few people here I have to give some points to, to and some concepts to, to make sure they get it, all right? Well, obviously, God is in control to work out his purposes to preserve the Jewish people because he loves them and because the Messiah would come from the Jews to rescue the world. Esther and Mordecai were those God used to accomplish this. God is still working out his purposes through the Messiah and those who are in the Messiah. We are in the Messiah. In the Messiah means all sorts of things. We're in the anointed one. Anointing is our inheritance. We're in the promised one. Promises of God are our inheritance. Amen? Whew. Therefore, he will continue to preserve his people and fulfill his purposes and use individuals. So what were the characteristics of Esther and Mordecai? Firstly, they were totally immersed in Persian culture. This is interesting. They were not back in Jerusalem amongst the people of God. Most Jews, after the decree of Cyrus to let my people go home to Jerusalem, most Jews didn't go. Most stayed and like Daniel, Esther and some of Jeremiah's teaching became examples to those of us who now live in non-Christian cultures dominated by another worldview. It's difficult. You have to do things you would rather not do or not say certain things. You have to refrain from expressing opinions now. Increasingly, that's so for the church in this country. Be careful how you put it. A book that I wrote 12 years ago, I've, I've just rewritten, it'll come out again soon, because I realized some of the things I said would not be acceptable in today's political correct climate, and I don't want to give offence, I want to be clear. At the time, no one thought anything of it. 
I'm still saying the same truth, I'm just saying it in different ways. We may feel obliged to seemingly make compromises. Not as extreme ones as Esther. Think of Esther. Godly Jewish young woman, taken probably in her teens, kept in a harem for a one year in order to spend a night with a pagan king and give him pleasure. How could you do that? Esther did. Now, what we in meeting, uh, sorry, living now in pagan cultures also have to live in that, and yet not as extreme as Esther. But there are issues we need to think about. You may be a school teacher who finds you have to teach things you don't really believe because you live in a secular humanist environment and you have to teach everything's on the syllabus. Is that true? You do? You may be a banker who might not like the excesses of capitalism. I'm not talking about capitalism itself, but it's excesses. But still has to do his job. You may be a musician, often playing in godless circumstances, yet you're there as a musician. Maybe a session musician, backing words that you don't really agree with. But you're there to be a musician in a godless culture. You may be working in film, some of which you wish weren't made, but you're a cameraman. The atmosphere and values in your office, or as a company, or in the company you work for, are not what you'd want but you still have to live it out and live in that environment. And when there's all sorts of small p politics going on, you have to steer a careful course, but often feel tainted by the atmosphere. You may be selling things that people don't really need. I when I was in banking, so I went through this. I was actually in Serbia, and I was sitting up late with everybody talking in the bar, because I did that, because that's when people were most open to hear the gospel. And so about two o'clock in the morning, we'd been chatting away, and they, they turned on me and said, you're a Christian, aren't you? and asked me to talk about it for a while. One of the guys then said to me, he said, I know this Christianity is true, but I'm not gonna become a Christian. So I said, how do you know it's true? He said, because my wife had multiple sclerosis. She went to a charismatic evangelical Christian meeting and got totally healed. I can't deny it. I believe Christianity is true. I hadn't quite expected that testimony. <laughs> I said, well, why can't you become a Christian then? And he said, because I'm selling here in Serbia things that the Serbian people don't really need. In fact, it's probably better for them if they don't have them. And I thought, hmm, and I'm here financing those sales. <sighs> I thought, Is his conscience greater than mine? more sensitive, but no, I'm in where I'm called to be, not agreeing with everything, but being in that culture because I know a time will come when I'll have to speak out on something that will bring salvation rather than worry too much about what's being sold to the different people. You may work as a social worker or another public sector job and you have to handle issues of adoption into lifestyles that you wouldn't be happy with. But it's your job and it's the law of the land that permits it. Some of you have to handle that. 
just like Esther did. Now there are issues of personal conscience and I respect anyone who stands against things. Some of you may think, if I was in full-time Christian ministry, I'd be much more effective. I wouldn't have to do that, but I'm stuck here. I've news for you. For the vast majority of you, by God's grace, you're in exactly the right place to accomplish his purposes, even if loads of the things you get involved with and the atmosphere in your office hurts you inside. So they were totally immersed in the culture. Mordecai was as well. He was a counsellor to the king. They took advantage of favour. The word favour here is the same word as the favour of the king and the favour of the eunuch is the same word as the loving kindness or grace of God. In the New Testament... The idea of grace was a Greek word taken from a pagan system of favour and patronage. That's what the word grace came from. And they experienced favour. Could I just say this? God, Mordecai, he saved the pagan king and was honoured. God sometimes, it somehow ensures that his people enjoy seasons of favour in the most unlikely circumstances. Look out for this. Take advantage of it. Sometimes, simply because you've worked hard, even though you've had to go along with all sorts of things, you've worked hard and the place gives you favour. Say, enjoy that favour because one day you being respected and honoured will give you an opportunity to break in with amazing fruit in the gospel. So, you're favoured and honoured and respected even in a godless society. They seize the moment of destiny at great personal risk. Esther had largely been passive, accepting what came her way. By daring to stand up when it mattered, even when at personal risk, she accomplished God's purposes. There is a time for daring faith. If I perish, I perish. That's more obvious in some parts of the world. Are you a kingdom initiative taker at the right time? Or will you remain passive under the culture? You save people if you take initiative when you've earned respect in that place. Then you take initiative for God's purposes and loads of things happen. Maybe a a person of mighty influence in your place of work suddenly gets saved and everything changes because you waited and then took initiative. Maybe something is transformed in where you work. I remember a time in my job when I was in a a very difficult, small p political situation where there was all sorts of vying for position and there was lots of changes and new people were coming in and the old guard were resentful. And it was so difficult and I didn't quite know what to do and nothing much happened and I didn't see much, should I go along with this, should I not? And then one day this guy came to me Senior, another manager came to me and said, can I talk to you? And I hadn't told him I was a Christian, not at that time. He came and said, I've just observed you. Can I talk to you? My life's in a mess. I've left my wife. I'm living with another woman. I feel hopeless and guilty. I don't know what to do. And I thought, David can help me. All right. Time of favour, and that guy is still going on with God now. He came to Christ, he's going on with God, became a leader in his church. <laughs> favour and taking initiative at the right time. And Mordecai knew when Esther was to take initiative. Sometimes we have to strengthen each other to take initiative for the kingdom of God. He refused to bow down to Haman. But he also urged Esther to act. God's mission is accomplished not by passivity, 
but by gracious acceptance of circumstances until it is clearly time to take initiative for the purpose of God. Have you got that? God's mission is accomplished not by passivity, but by gracious acceptance of circumstances until it is time to take initiative for the purposes of Christ. Uh, back, in, back home in, where, in my own church, we've been working in an, one of the upper schools in Bedford for many years. Gradually, through the work of our youth ministry and by pupils at that school, who are members of our church, we've gained favor. It's taken years just serving that school. And then just recently, they approached our youth worker, the school did, and asked us to be mentors for all the problem kids that are in danger of expulsion. So they asked the church to mentor them. You understand? <laughs> favor, then the right time. And because of our outreach to young people, our youth leaders knew most of those, kid, those young people anyway. Faith needs to be bold and active. Sometimes it's praying for healing in tough, in things that where it's a little bit difficult. Stepping out at work, not only on the streets, which is difficult enough, sometimes it can be more difficult at work, just to say, yes, I'm gonna pray for you, I've done that. Knowing that if God doesn't turn up, you may lose respect or feel a failure. For some, you may lose financially or career-wise. In certain parts of the world, even your life. But defining moments may come unexpectedly, pass quickly, yet with far-reaching consequences. Seize them for the kingdom of God. Be an Esther and a Mordecai. They mingled daring faith with wisdom. Esther was indirect appropriate to the culture, invited them for a meal. Did it relationally, not unnecessarily provocatively. They were totally committed to all of God's people. It wasn't their personal destiny here. In our individualistic Western culture, it's so often our personal destiny that we'll step out for. Here, they didn't step out for their personal destiny. No one knew Esther was a Jew. But for the sake of the people of God. Simon said earlier, he loves the church. I love the church. Our inheritance in Christ is wonderful. It's being loved, forgiven, fathered, accepted, not condemned. It's also wonderful because it means we are part of a people, the people of God in the earth who are going to accomplish his purposes. That's what they were concerned about. Then a woman and a man were both equally needed to fulfill God's purposes. To establish these days of Purim, it says Esther 9.31, at their designated times as Mordecai the Jew and Queen Esther had decreed for them. Men and women are equally needed and equally prominent in this rescue of God's people. Because of our belief as a family of churches, in servant headship, in husbands in the home, and male elders of the church, we are sometimes not given, we have sometimes given too strong a male emphasis in accomplishing the purposes of God. We want to demonstrate something different, that together, men and women, as well as prophetically was spoken of yesterday in terms of all the generations. Together, we're all needed for the accomplishment of the purposes of God. And we've tried. <laughs> and you will notice we've deliberately tried to model that during this festival. Okay, because it's important. And also, people who can have fun as well. <laughs> you know, they all inaugurated Purim and they said, be solemn and have fun as well. One day, be solemn. The next day, have a great party and a great laugh. 
send presents to each other, love it, hiss and boo when Haman's name is mentioned, and rejoice in the deliverance of God. Will we be Esther's and Mordecai's? These Bible stories are so important. Storytelling defines and builds relationship and changes lives as people identify with the story. Storytelling defines community because stories shape who we are. This story helped shape the people of God in the Old Testament. Each one of us then, let's seize the opportunity. I just wanna say to you, be where you are. Live for God where you are. Often it'll trouble you doing the things you have to do. But as you do that, God will use you to accomplish his purposes if when you get favour, you act with initiative for the purposes of God to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Okay, he may tell you to move somewhere else like Martin was saying. He may tell you to stay where you are and work hard there, but you will be used where you are to serve the purposes of God and be part of this mission to see the whole earth restored, every tribe and tongue and nation, all bowing before Jesus, believing that more will be accomplished through the gospel. There will be a, an abundance of salvations. Our nation will turn, the nations will be reached because Esther and Mordecai's went from this Bible, uh, this, sorry, this festival and... <laughs> touch the places where they work and live. God bless you as you do it.